morning to you all and good afternoon to our brothers and sisters from the Eastern and Southern Africa. You are welcome to today's webinar. My name is Doreen Apia. I work with Aflia. The topic for today is open with purpose, taking action to build structural equity and inclusion. The purpose for our, our webinar this morning is to understand how knowledge sharing in indigenous language foster equity and inclusion, learn how to use the translation software on Wikipedia, and also learn how to participate in the Open Access Week translation contest. The Open Access Week is starting from today, 19 to 25th October, as we all know as librarians. I'd like you to know that the webinar materials will be shared after the webinar to all participants. A recording of the webinar will also be uploaded onto the Aflia YouTube channel. So those who like to go there and listen can do so again. We are at the moment streaming live on Facebook. And so I wish to welcome our brothers and sisters on Facebook joining us and to welcome all of you here in the meeting this morning. Our, we have three speakers for this webinar, but the first speaker I'm going to introduce will take us through the first and then when he's done, we will introduce the second and the third speakers. The first speaker is Nick Shockey, who is a director of programs and engagement at SPAC, where he focuses on fostering and supporting communities that advance open access, open education, and open data. Nick founded the Right to Research Coalition an international alliance of student organizations collectively representing millions of students in over 100 countries around the world. And also that promotes um, policies and practices that make open the default for research. In 2014, Nick led the launch of OpenCon, a conference and community that works to identify cultivate and empower leaders within the next generation to advance openness in research and education. To date, the OpenCon has reached more than 10,000 in-person participants across 80 countries and catalyzed dozens of new projects, organizations, and campaigns. In 2018 and 2019, the OpenCon collaborated with UN on OpenCon United Nations headquarters and a follow-up conference on open science. Nick is also particularly passionate about working with libraries to support their institutions in adopting open practices for research. I want to inform, I'd like to inform participants that if you wish to ask a question, there is a Q and A button on your screen to the bottom of your to the button on your screen please click on that one and type your questions there after the presentation the questions will be answered appropriately nick you are welcome to this morning's training please your Students are ready, so kindly take over. <laughs> thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for uh, the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with with you all this morning, um, and uh, yeah, really appreciate the the invitation and the the organizers have given me um, quite a few topics to cover in the the fifteen to twenty minutes uh, that uh, that I'll have this morning. So. Um, uh, I will will go ahead and dive right in, and you know, just uh, to begin, I'd like to, you know, of course, welcome you all to, uh, you know, the 2020 International Open Access Week, and 
um, you know, as uh, as was just said, this year's theme is is open with purpose, taking action to build structural equity and inclusion. Um, you know, and this is this is the third year in a row that the Open Access Week theme is really focused in on um, you know some aspect of of equity and inclusion. Um, you know that I think signifies just how important these areas are. Um, you know, both for discussion as well as for action. Um, for you know, sort of all of us uh, across the world uh, to, to focus on. And I particularly appreciate this group's um, sort of effort to not only have discussions around this year's theme, but really try to jump into to, to concrete action as well with the translation project. Um, so the organizers have asked me to you know, sort of provide an overview of the open access of the, the various reasons why it's um, you know, sort of necessary. Um, and actually, before I dive in, there's a bit of background noise, um, um, and it would be great if one of the organizers could just uh, to mute any folks that are, are off mute to, to take care of that. Thanks. Um, perfect. So, um, as I said, uh, I've been asked to sort of provide an overview of uh, you know, sort of of what open access is, sort of why why it's important, um, you know, and uh, sort of how that that ties into to this year's theme. Uh, so, you know, to, to start, I, you know, sort of think it's important to ask a pretty fundamental question, um, you know, which is that if we're going to build a system for sharing research that, that's equitable, what, what are some of the current challenges um, within the current system that, that we must address? And so, you know, I think open access will answer some of these, but I think it's, you know, important to really start with a, a broader inventory of the, the challenges that, that we have to, to address. And so, um, you know, of course, I think one of the biggest ones um, that certainly comes as no surprise is the incredible cost of access still um, to most academic journals. Um, you know, and I won't dwell on this too much because it is, you know, such, um, you know, a clear problem in the, the current system. Um, you know, but I, I think the, you know, prices of academic journal titles, um, you know, really tell the, the whole story and just how challenging it can be. To get to get access to these journals because they are so expensive in the current model, um, you know, and luckily as we shift to an open access system, this is something that that should change. But um, it's still obviously a, a huge, huge barrier. And I think um, you know, sort of one of the takeaways from from this point that was sort of made probably most succinctly by the Economist um, when they called academic publishing a license to print money. Um, you know, and that certainly speaks to its profitability to the companies that, you know, are currently leading the market. But I think perhaps even more importantly, it speaks to, you know, sort of what the system's designed to do. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, not terribly good at giving people access, given all the, the access barriers that, that, you know, folks around the world face. Um, you know, it's really, you know, its primary purpose is to, um, you know, enrich the companies that, um, that you know currently publish academic uh, research, and I think an important you know again thing to to realize that again I'm sure many of you on the call are quite familiar with um, is that it, it just simply doesn't need to be this way. So many of the inputs uh, into this process are given voluntarily by researchers, you know, in the forms of you know providing their research for free to journals to publish uh, and voluntary labor in the peer review and editing process. Um, you know, so there really really doesn't need to to be this expensive. Um, you know, and that, you know, sort of that fact is also what, uh, you know, is an important point for, you know, sort of how open access can be successful um, in lowering the barriers, um, not just uh, to read, but also to, to participation. Um, you know, and I want to sort of uh, touch on one, one brief point, um, which is, you know, obviously there are um, certain initiatives to try to mitigate sort of the worst uh, sort of negative aspects of the current subscription-based system, and one that I'm sure uh, you know many, if not all, uh, that are on the the webcast this morning are familiar with the the Hanari uh, program. You know, including uh, you know sort of uh, uh, similar initiatives like Research for Life that provide you know discounted or, or free access to a subset of published journals to. Um, you know, a number of institutions that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford them. Uh, but I just want to flag at the outset that this is, you know, really a Band-Aid solution. Um, you know, and I think in uh, you know, 2011, when the entire country of Bangladesh was cut off from the system um, temporarily, because, you know, at the time, 
the publishers behind the Hanare initiative, um, you had decided that Bangladesh, you know, it sort of uh, had enough wealth at that point that they should be paying full price, um, you know, just overnight turned off their access, um, you know, just shows how tenuous relying, um, you know, sort of on these, um, you know, sort of the, the goodwill of the, the publishers uh, can be and how we need a sort of more fundamental uh, solution, um, you know, than, than, you know, these kinds of, of initiatives. Um, you know, another point tied in with this is that, you know, it's not just enough to be able to read the research literature, we also need, you know, equity of, of participation, you know, of the ability to, um, you know, contribute on equal footing to the research literature and, and not just, you know, not just read it, but actually participate in, in the scholarly conversation. Um, you know, so moving from, you know, sort of access to broader, you know, sort of challenges um, around equity in the, the current system there, there's certainly, certainly many that, that we need to address. Um, and I think Barbara Rivera Lopez, um, you know, has uh, been a really compelling uh, sort of critic of the current system and the lack of representation on editorial boards and, and many different disciplines. And this is a quote from a piece uh, that we published from her on uh, last year's Open Access Week, you know, showing that more than 50% of the editorial boards on uh, many disciplines are, are from literally just two countries. Um, you know, also pointing out the editorial bias against uh, authors uh, in Africa, in Asia, in, in Latin America, you know, partially, you know, based on, um, you know, sort of the, the academic level English um, you know, sort of the way the editorial boards view those as well as, as the research topics, um, you know, that are of interest, um, you know, in, in places like Africa, Latin America, and Asia um, that may not be valued appropriately by editorial boards, um, you know, which is, you know, obviously a huge challenge that, you know, it's not just a question of access, but um, goes more deeply in something we need to pay close, close attention to. Um, you know, sort of flowing on from that, and again, related to what this group will be doing for Open Access Week, uh, you know, the, the language diversity in publishing and even open access publishing, uh, you know, unfortunately still continues to, uh, um, you know, fall far short of, uh, you know, what, what we would ideally like to see in a more equitable system. Uh, and this is just, this is just one example of, you know, sort of the, the amount of language representation in the directory of open access books uh, that was published a year ago. Um, you know, just showing, again, just how English centric uh, that, that resource is. Um, but of course, uh, I'll show, you know, data on Wikipedia later in this presentation, um, you know, that in many ways resembles uh, this, this graph. And I don't think this, you know, comes as a surprise to folks on, uh, you know, on the call, but I think it's important to, to raise as sort of a central problem and central source of inequity within the current system that, that must be addressed. And then, you know, sort of finally on this point, you know, there's certainly many more challenges than I have time to mention. Um, but one sort of emerging area of inequity that I think it's important to pay attention to or, or point out uh, is that as automated tools are integrated into the publishing process, uh, into the peer review process, for example, I think we need to watch that very, very carefully to make sure you know, further inequities are introduced. And I think um, you know, the application of you know, AI or machine learning to the peer review process um, is an area of particular concern. Um, you know, that if you use, you know, algorithms, uh, you know, sort of train them over, um, you know, the currently published research, um, you, it's you know, very clear that they could pick up, you know, biases from, uh, you know, from the sort of training corpus that they use to, to teach the AI, um, you know, that, that would, you know, uh, uh, reinforce inequities, uh, you know, and so may, you know, for example, building on Barbara Rivera Lopez's point around, um, you know, sort of the way in which uh, academic English can be a barrier uh, from authors for whom English isn't a first language. Um, you could see how these tools, if not, you know, monitored uh, very closely, uh, you know, could, you know, uh, recognize errors in English, uh, you know, as somehow, um, you know, sort of speaking to uh, the quality of the research. Um, when in reality, it's, you know, just the extra work that a researcher, you know, who, who doesn't speak English as a first language has to do in order to participate in the conversation. And so, you know, as there's more automation, I think we have to be really careful um, to make sure that that doesn't introduce even, even you know, more biases into this, this system. 
And so uh, yeah, that's sort of the, uh, I suppose the, the more negative aspect of, of this presentation, um, you know, and the, the solution we advocate for to address um, some of these challenges, not, not all, but uh, certainly many of them is, uh, you know, is, is open access. And again, I imagine many on the call are familiar with this term, but for those that may not be uh, open access is simply the idea that all scholarly and scientific articles should be made freely and immediately. Uh, available online with with full reuse rights. So, um, you know, available at no cost uh, to anyone with uh, an internet connection or even, uh, you know, uh, potentially those without internet connections as well, if, you know, the research literature can be um, bulk downloaded and, you know, taken offline onto to hard drives. Um, you know, so taking care of that access barrier, but, um, you know, that these articles are not just freely accessible, but also openly accessible and come with an open license that allows uh, for them to be uh, you know, reused, remixed, translated, uh, you know, text and data mined, um, you know, really reused to the, the fullest extent possible. Um, you know, so again, there's sort of two paths um, to, to open access that we, we talk about. One is certainly publishing in open access journals that make all of their uh, articles freely and immediately accessible online um, without cost, like those published by the Public Library of Science or, uh, for example, Bioline International. Um, but then, of course, there's the other path of self-archiving, where even if uh, an article is published in a subscription-based journal, a copy of the manuscripts made publicly accessible to to anyone on online. Um, you know, and so of course, there are you know, more open access journals than than ever, um, with more than fifteen thousand open access journals in in publication now, according to the directory of of open access journals and. Uh, similarly, there is uh, you know, a huge amount of the research literature that can be made publicly accessible through institutional repositories um, you know, that more than 82% of publishers allow authors to make some version of their article publicly available, even, in a, you know, even if it's originally published in a subscription-based journal. Um, you know, so these are the, the two paths uh, to, to open access. And you know, I think it's again important to point out that there's um, you know a real uh, you know sort of large amount of momentum behind open access these days, particularly when it comes to um, you know sort of research funder open access policies um, you know that are continuing to um, you know, sort of come online um, at a, a pretty a pretty high rate. Um, you know, so I'll just go through these really quickly, but um, you know just in the last month. Um, the government of India has come out with, um, you know, sort of a, a plan to open up um, the, the research that, that it funds. Um, and I think it's important to point out here, and you can see in the, the bottom quote, um, you know, that the government of India is trying to, um, you know, sort of go a different way and not, not rely on models that uh, charge article processing fees um, to authors publishing in journals, um, you know, but to focus more on on repositories, um, you know, sort of that that green route, that second route that can uh, you know, sort of accomplish the goal of making things open without creating um, you know a, a high cost structure. Um, um, I'll ask that the organizers. It sounds like somebody's come off mute. If you could uh, uh, take care of that, please. Uh, you know, of course, the you know, India is, is the most recent example, but of course, there, there are many others with uh, the government of Canada um, sort of announcing a full open research policy. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the, the government of China uh, having public access policies, opening up access to their research uh, in place for a number of years now, and them saying that they expect to see uh, a fully open science environment coming over the, the, next, uh, the next few years. And of course, um, you know, the European Commission and the European Union, um, you're having full open research policies in place for, for a number of years now. Um, you know, so in, in sort of in closing, just to bring sort of this conversation back to this year's theme, um, you know, I think open can be, um, you know, sort of part of the solution in reaching a more equitable system for um, communicating, you know, research and scholarship. Uh, you know, but the, these systems, these structures have to be built intentionally with, with equity uh, at, at the core. Um, you know, we really need community owned, community govern, governed uh, infrastructure that sort of puts the values of the academic community at the core, um, rather than that profit motive, um, you know, or as the economist called it, you know, sort of that license to print money, it needs to, you know, sort of not, not do that, but focus, uh, you know, on 
on values and maximizing equity rather than uh, than profit. And um, yeah, you know, for time, and we'll skip over that. Uh, but I just want to point out, a, you know, a, a couple of examples of that kind of you know, sort of community uh, owned um, sort of open infrastructure, um, you know, sort of publication projects that are in line with with these values. And I think African Minds is a, a great example, um, you know, of the kinds of outlets that really prioritize, um, you know, sort of the, the scholarship and the research that's, you know, sort of most relevant, um, you know, to the African context, but that might not, you know, be prioritized in the, the same way. Um, you know, as much as it needs to be by other types of, um, you know, of, of publications that are based in, uh, in, in Europe or, or North America. Um, you know, and I think an important thing, you know, that we need to pay attention to is, uh, is uh, what's called bibliodiversity or, um, you know, sort of the diversity of the different sort of um, modes of production of scholarly research. Um, you know, and, and try to counteract this trend of, you know, more and more of sort of the publication um, sort of machinery um, being resident in North America and Europe um, and being much more globally distributed in the way that, that African Minds is. Um, or, you know, this is a, a, a sort of graph from the International African Institute that was made in collaboration with African uh, Africa Archive, um, showing sort of a, a network map of, a map of all the repositories uh, across the, the African content, uh, continent, rather. And I think these repositories also, you know, represent, um, you sort of that um, values aligned infrastructure that can make research and scholarship uh, openly accessible at far lower cost um, um, than some of the commercial open access uh, journals. And I imagine many on this call are, uh, you know, sort of the, the people who are, who are responsible for the success of these repositories and getting content from scholars on your campuses uh, online and available to the world. Uh, and really, really appreciate the, the work that you do, the difficult work to make um, those repositories successful. And so uh, in closing, uh, this is uh, a chart of uh, all of the different, uh, well, the top of a chart of uh, uh, different language Wikipedias um, showing the number of articles available uh, in, in those different Wikipedias. And I sort of pulled this uh, over just to show, you know, again, something that I think is, um, you know, uh, an obvious point to this group, which is just simply the um, disparities in representation uh, across, uh, you know, not just journals, but that obviously Wikipedia, um, you know, and, and the ways that negatively impacts, uh, you know, um, you know, folks that can't access Wikipedia in different languages, um, you know, or just, you know, the, um, how different it is to read Wikipedia and, you know, a, a language that's not your first language. Uh, and we you know, really, really appreciate the work that this group will be doing over the course of Open Access Week to translate different articles uh, into uh, to Wikipedia in, in local African languages and really grow those resources for the communities uh, that, that they serve. And um, sort of related to that, that point, also want to point out that, you know, obviously there are broader uh, gaps in knowledge. It's not just about translating the resources, but also uh, you know, making sure that uh, marginalized communities and sort of their experience are represented um, in Wikipedia, um, which uh, hopefully will be part of, uh, uh, of this group's efforts during Open Access Week as well. And so uh, again, sort of in, in closing, just want to point out um, you know, sort of how these issues intersect with um, you know, sort of the UN Declaration on Human Rights with uh, access to knowledge being, being a human right. Um, and this is a quote from the US uh, Librarian of Congress. Um, that she gave at OpenCon UN in 2018, you know, sort of speaking to equity of access being a human right. Um, but then last year, um, we hosted a roundtable discussion on uh, sort of open science and uh, at the United Nations. And there was a strong focus that you know, open research is, is really a core accelerator of the sustainable development goals. And that if we're going to reach uh, the SDGs, um, we really need to put open research and open scholarship at, at the heart and not just have equity of access, uh, but also equity of participation and allowing, you know, people around the world to contribute, um, you know, on an equal footing to the scholarly conversation. Um, uh, you know, I think that that really is, is critical. Um, and so, um, you know, again, really appreciate uh, this group's work, um, you know, certainly during Open Access Week with the translations, but also um, your work year round. Um, you know, to, to make open uh, successful on, on the African content, uh, continent and sharing out uh, African scholarship with, with the rest of the world that, that needs to read it. And so 
Uh, I think I'm right at 20 minutes, so I will we'll stop there. Um, not sure if we have time for questions now since I used my full 20 minutes, um, but if anybody has questions that we don't have time for, happy for you to, to email me directly um, with my email on the screen. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to the uh, facilitators. Thank you very much. This is very insightful. And then um, please, if you wish to ask any question, kindly use the Q&A button below your screen, and then we will take it up from there. We will now introduce our second speaker, who is Alice Kibombo. Alice Kibombo is a librarian working with the Goethe Institute in Uganda. And she is also the Wikipedia in residence for the AFLIA and the Wikipedia projects. Alice, you are welcome to this morning's webinar. Kindly take over. Hello, Alice. Hello, Alice. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can now hear you. All please, right. I hope you, you heard the introduction. So, yes, I did. Can. All right, please take Thank over. you very much. Uh, good afternoon from Uganda, and uh, good morning still to uh, my colleagues in the West and from all other parts of the continent. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And without further ado, I'm just going to dive into the topic. As we all know, and we have been informed, this is the Open Access Week. And AFLIA as a collective is going to honor this Open Access Week by contributing translations and continent that is actually about African cinema. African cinema is not only limited to what we see on the continent, but we also have relatives in the diaspora. We have communities that are far flung. So that also includes them. So feel free to contribute that sort of content in the coming week and uh, in your local languages. And this is our agenda for today. There are issues, if we're going by the theme, there are issues that are compounding the structural imbalances. There's a relationship between open knowledge libraries and cinema. There are structural imbalances that we have to look at that may not be within our control. There's also the politics of the open knowledge movement, uses and impact of African cinema, how Wikipedia is practicing structural equity and inclusion and how we can also address the imbalance. So just to compound the issue, when I was doing my research, I came across research by Henderson et al. This is as late as um, earlier six years ago, actually not late, that uh, when we are regarding local languages in terms of participating in all knowledge economies, our languages seen are as a minor implementation issue a mere communication problem, and this is overcome with bilingual translators. This is what research posed. And you see, when you have such a sort of finding, this means that this, this issue just reinforces the inequalities around education, around language, around literacy and gender, as a, and as Nick had said, these are some of the things that are actually affecting and reinforcing inequalities around uh, the access and participation. And then if we relate it to African cinema, this is a quote by Usman Sambeni. I don't know if I've said the name correctly, but in relation to cinema, because this is what he was known for, he is regarded as one of the fathers of African cinema, that Africa is his audience, it was his audience. The West and the rest were only targeted as markets. So what does that mean for us? It means that 
if African cinema filmmakers or filmmakers in Africa are looking at us as the audience, then this content needs to be relatable to us. It also needs to be in languages that we understand, and it also needs to be presented in an equitable way. And then when you come to the open knowledge movement, when you come to cinema, when you come to libraries, the one thing all these three have in common is the patrons that frequent them. The patrons who watch and enjoy cinema for entertainment, the students who are using it for educational purposes, those who frequent libraries so that they can use it as part of, as an extension of their learning, and also the open knowledge movement. It has patrons of it, you know, people who are not going to be able to pay for things that are behind a paywall. So these are the people who patronize our spaces and we need to do something for them in relation to all that. And these are some of the structural imbalances that are actually preventing our patrons from being able to access the kind of information it is that we could have. You have the tyranny of the connected and you know, it's a running joke that uh, the internet in Africa is always up and down. But the truth is, it's, it, it is what it is. And because we are not connected in terms of the internet uh, and there's a divide, <laughs> a digital divide and a participatory divide, you will find that those who are in societies that are connected are actually the ones who have the time to share, the time to create the content. So they're the ones going to be um, giving our narrative. So that's a, a structural imbalance. Some of it we have control over, some of it we don't have. Then when it comes to contributing knowledge, even if it's not in the open knowledge community, just everywhere there's gendered knowledge contribution, you will find that even in traditional days when writing had just come to Africa, it is the men who are trained. When it comes to the open knowledge movement, for example, when you're dealing with Wikipedia, the standard model of a contributor or an editor is a white middle-aged male individual so who is talking about the ladies who is talking about the alphabet communities so that's another structural imbalance that we deal with and then when it comes to the open knowledge movement we have mor morality laundering and there's also content censorship related to point number one where the connected are they are going to be setting the standards so if we put or if another society is going to put something in the utmost, in the, if they're going to put something out there, you will find that whatever it is, is going to be subject to standards of morality and any other issue that is out there. It's going to be subject to um, what they regard as this is the norm, this is not the norm, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. So this imbalance is being reinforced by us being told what we can and what we cannot present in ways we can and ways in which we cannot. And then um, this could be an advantage, but it also compounds uh, this imbalance. There's the diversity of languages. Um, we come from countries where, you know, a country could have as many as 32 languages. Nobody is going to know all those languages. But then we are all going to, you know, defer to the one, what they call national language. It could be Portuguese, it could be French, it could be English. So the, div the language diversity within our communities is actually reinforcing some of these inequalities. But ironically, it is also going to be able to help us overcome these structural imbalances. And then we get to the open knowledge movement. In open, by open knowledge movement, in this, in this context, I'm going to refer to Wikipedia because that is what we are familiar with. We all know that as we speak right now, it could be a self-claim, it could be exaggerated, 
but everybody seems to be agree that it is the largest collection of free collaborative knowledge in human history. Millions of us as individuals and as a collective, as we are going to do, are writing and we are adding to Wikipedia and anybody can edit it at any time. So that's a fact. That's a fact when you come to the politics of open knowledge. And you know, Wikipedia is increasingly gaining the status as a default reference tool for other printed textual knowledge artifacts. You'll find that um, for those who did one lib, one ref, you'll find that uh, the, um, the parameters for the things that you could use for citation were quite strict. And you know, the citations and the references that you use are actually some of the things that give credibility to the, to the information it is that you're putting out there. That is something, it could be something of, um, it could be something to measure the quality, but it's something that we have to deal with. And then when we look at the, con at the content that Wikipedia is actually offering, it deals with so many things. It deals with historical issues, contemporary issues, things that are going on, things that are happening right now, things that, okay, maybe not predicted, but so Wikipedia is actually offering us critical insights into the contemporary status of, of knowledge. So thanks to Wikipedia, we know about things that could have happened in the 1600s. We can relate them to what is happening right now. And it also gives us a feel of what is going on in our communities. Okay, so we've looked at the structural imbalances. We've looked at Wikipedia. We've looked at the We've looked at the, and we've also looked at the politics of open knowledge. And then even within Wikipedia itself, because it's an encyclopedia and it, it, it encompasses so, so many things. As a collective within AFLIA, we said, okay, fine, let us deal with African cinema. African cinema, is large, it is huge. It is not only the things that you see uh, coming through your television. It is the performing arts. It is the media that is being created. It is the media that is being distributed. It is the content that is being, um, it is the content that is being created by uh, what would call the creatives. So the impact of African cinema for us right now there is a growing respect and regulation for the arts. So you're going to see this manifest in, you know, governing bodies, performing society bodies, and people are actually according cinema, it's respect that people can actually now go and begin as professionals in that area. And then even when it comes to cinema, we are seeing that it is increasingly being used as a medium of ed education, and introduction, leave alone the Zoom meetings that we have, but very many people who studied um, library science, I'm, I'm sure have seen that there are course units on multimedia as an independent means of adding to your collection and disseminating information to your patrons. And then even when you come economically, Film is now being seen as a, it's, 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 it's a business and it's a tool of commerce. It's contributing to GDP, it's contributing to employment and solving a little, a number of social issues. And then also we see that local cinema has grown exponentially. You have industries like Nollywood, you have yoga wood. I know in South Sudan, they have saucy wood. They said it would be coming to a screen near us, but we see it on YouTube. And the content that is there is something that we can relate to as Africans. The contributors, and I'm talking about the actors and all the other people that fall in to contribute, are relatable to us. The content meaning 
what is being shown are things that you can laugh about because you understand. The contributors, the actors, the actresses are people that we actually know and relate to. They are not disembodied. And then cinema is now being distributed through me formal means, major channels. You will see African productions on Netflix. You will see Movie Magic uh, on Mnet. And... Um, and cinema is also being used as a major means of dissemination of culture and history. I'll give an example of some museums, especially here in Uganda, that are actually getting sponsorship to have history being reenacted. And it is part of what they show their patrons when they are describing something. So it's now being used for dissemination of culture and history. So that is how we stand with all those three. So when we come to the world of Wikipedia, how are we practicing structural equity and inclusion on Wikipedia? We will find that um, because uh, the, I'll call them the big language Wikipedias, uh, they have their standards for contributing. Standards still apply to local languages, but because you're contributing in a local language, you will find that, um, sorry, because you're going to contribute, let's say in English or French or German, you might be subjected to very stringent measures and it will leave you feeling disenfranchised when your articles are deleted. So contribution in your local language is critical to empower us locally. And then when you, you find that when you write in a local language, you it's more participatory, it's more inclusive. People are actually willing to participate in something, you know, with a growing sense of patriotism, with a growing sense of local media and local languages, it's participatory and it's inclusive. And then as librarians, when you are working through a local language, it is easier to disseminate this information. Very many of us, when people come to the libraries, we say, okay, let me explain the plot of this movie, or let me explain this narrative in the local language, giving it the way you understand accurately using your local, um, using your local equivalents in a way that is relatable too. And it's also a means to preserve your local language because you've documented it. So how, which ways can we address the imbalances that we are experiencing in when it comes to open knowledge and in Wikipedia to be specific? Uh, for the next two months, uh, there's the Afrocine project. It is dedicated to um, compiling information on the African continent and in the diaspora about African cinema. So you could participate in that and we are going to participate in that. Please write in your local language where it's possible so that the people in your commune or in your locale that are not able to read English or one of the big languages are actually able to write, sorry, are actually able to read and know more about the things that they see in their, um, in, in their language. And then also contribute content. You know, when it comes to cinema specifically, translate industry terms into your local language equivalent. You know, in English, it might be a movie director, but in your local language, it is something else. Write about the contributors that are within your community. We do not know them. So we need to engage you to know them. You know, as librarians, you're at the forefront of giving this information when people don't know it. You've actually been in the community. You've sought it out. You've curated this. You saw a newspaper article. You've done some more research. Please write about your local actors. Write about events. Write about productions, tell us the unique industry practices in a language that we will understand. Clean up content, this content that is existing, that actually um, could be poorly written or, you know, there's information that has since superseded it. 
clean up this content, add, beef up the quality of this. And then, you know, when you feel you're stuck, this is not a job for you alone. Collaborate with others. And there's a lot of work on Wikimedia Commons, specifically videos that would need subtitles. So that if I came to you speaking the local language and you wanted to show me maybe something humorous, something that portrays what's going on, something that reflects society, there are subtitles for me to read, assuming I'm literate, and that will make these topics more understandable to us. So, um, within the Wikimedia movement, we have committed to a very strategic direction by 2030. And under, under that commitment, we seek to focus our efforts on the knowledge and communities that have been left out by structures of power and privilege. And if I may add to the structures of power and privilege, the things that are reinforcing the imbalances in the structural equity. We are also committed to welcoming people from every background, every background imaginable. Everybody has a story to tell. Everybody knows something that we don't know. We welcome everybody to build strong and diverse communities because diversity is a form of inclusion. We are also committed to breaking those barriers that you see, the social, political, and technical barriers that are preventing all of our patrons from accessing and contributing knowledge to free knowledge. So this is our commitment as Wikimedia. This is a commitment I would also implore African librarians to take up and then be able to be of more service to yourself and to the community that you serve. Because different people, every everybody needs some different form of information. So you need to be on the lookout for that. So please take action, pay attention to the detail. And I wish us all happy editing and a fruitful contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for linking the theme for us and helping us to understand how this is going to work. Our third presenter or trainer is Ameh Aharoni. He's a, he's a senior strategist with the languages team at the Wikipedia Foundation. We are so blessed to have him here because he is going to take us through the practical training or the content translation tool on Wikipedia. So those of us who wish to uh, participate in the contest, kindly uh, get yourself ready and learn how to use the translation tool on Wikipedia because that is what we are going to use for the contest. I also wish to inform you that um, there will be certificates for the contestants. All right. Um, since Amer is ready, Amer kindly take over. Thank you. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, hello, and uh, you should also be able to see me speaking. Uh, and you should also be able to see my uh, screen with uh, Wikipedia. Okay. Hi. Hello. Uh, I uh, want to begin by thanking the previous speaker, um, Alice Kibombo, uh, for an excellent presentation. Um, the uh, social issues uh, about the importance of uh, uh, translation and uh, generally writing in uh, your languages uh, and developing the language diversity of Wikipedia. Uh, she presented them really well. Uh, so I really have nothing to add. It was just excellent. So uh, what is left for me to do 
is just to show uh, one of the ways in which you can practice this uh, language diversity and uh, uh, the way in which you can uh, quite easily with relatively little effort uh, create content in your languages in uh, Wikipedia. Uh, people who are listening here, uh, there are people who speak a lot of different languages of Africa. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy about this. I uh, feel really privileged to, to do this uh, and I hope to be of use. So how do we start? Uh, content translation is a, a feature built into Wikipedia, uh, which helps create articles by translating them from another language. So for example, if there's an article that exists in the English or French or Portuguese uh, or Russian Wikipedia, um, any language in which you can read well, and it doesn't exist in another language in which you can write, uh, could be really um, any language, uh, whatever, Hausa, Zulu, Yoruba, um, anything else, you can use the built-in content translation tool to translate this article into your language quite easily. Uh, now I'm going to show you how to do this uh, and later uh, you can reach out to me. I'm fairly easy to find on Wikipedia and on email. Um, and if you have any more questions, I'll be happy to help you. Uh, but I'll give you this uh, demo, uh, how to do this, how to start doing this. Uh, and uh, I will uh, answer right away to some uh, uh, very common questions. And if you have any more questions, again, you can, uh, you can reach out to me later. So to use content translation, you need to create a Wikipedia account and log in. Uh, it only works for users who logged in. You need to enable content translation. How to, uh, because by default it is disabled. So you need to enable content translation in the preferences. How you do this, after you log in, you look at the top of the screens. You can see uh, my uh, username here. So this is uh, Amir E80. So your username will appear at the same place. And then you see all these other little links. So there's talk, sandbox, preferences, beta. So beta is the link that you need to click. So it takes a few seconds to load. And then you get to the beta features preferences. So for those of you who don't know, in uh, computer software, uh, something that is beta is um, some kind of a new uh, feature that has uh, been experimented. Uh, content translation is actually not such a new feature. It's, it's already five years old. Uh, so it, we actually gradually taking it out of the beta status, but for now it is still defined as uh, beta. Uh, if you look at, if you look, uh, if you look at it from the English Wikipedia. So you go to beta and then you need to scroll down. So there are several beta features here. Some of, I enabled some of them and I disabled some of them, uh, but you can see here some new video player reference previews. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Content translation is the one that uh, you need to enable. So make sure that the checkbox here is, is on and uh, then you need to uh, push the save button uh, at the bottom. So that's how you uh, enable content translation and then you will be able to use it. Now, once you enabled uh, content translation, take a look at, uh, again, at the top of the screen at your uh, uh, we, we, we call this the private tools. So uh, again, your username and then uh, the links to talk, sandbox, preferences, beta. We already spoke about beta. Then you have watch list, a watch list as a separate feature. Contributions. So contributions is where you will find content translation, how you, how you can remember this. So translation that you will be doing is a kind of contribution. So uh, there are many ways to to Wikipedia, but one of them is translation. So look at contributions, and then there is this item called translations, and you click this. This gets you to the content translation dashboard. Uh, a few seconds, and we'll see this. So uh, once you're here, you can look at uh, the dashboard. So in the dashboard, you see uh, the new translation button at the top. We will speak about this in a minute. Uh, if you don't know what to translate, uh, from what I understood, you in this group, you, you more or less know what you will be translating about. You will be translating on uh, various articles related to uh, African cinema. But just so you know, uh, if you 
want to translate something, you want to give some of your time, uh, and uh, but you're not sure what you want to translate about, you can try clicking on the suggestions button, and it will show you all kind of um, all kinds of uh, articles that don't yet exist in the language into which you want to translate. Um, it, it is automatically tailored to every user, but um, you don't have to use it. You, like suggestions is only if you don't know what to translate and you need a suggestion. The in progress button shows translations that you have already started. So I, I am I am now translating an article about an Indian educator. Uh, so I can uh, I haven't yet finished it. So it appears here uh, in progress. Uh, if you haven't started anything, that then this um, then this will be empty. Now, if I want to start a new translation, then I click this button at the top, new translation. Uh, so if you are now looking at your laptop, please don't do what I do because uh, every user can translate only one uh, can like only one user can translate the same article at the time. So um, I, I'm going to pick an article. Please don't pick the same article as I do. Uh, so first, I need to pick the language. So I speak Hebrew. So the language into which I usually translate is Hebrew. So this button here, so th there's the search box at the top, which says search for a page to translate. And then there's this uh, button which shows the language. And if I click this uh, button, I can select language. So I'm going to select, uh, for example, let's see, Yoruba, just as an example. Um, so. Uh, oh, sorry, mistake. This is a language from which I'm going to translate. Uh, let's select English as the, as the language from which I'm going to translate. And uh, yeah, oh, just a second. Yeah, okay. English is a language from which I'm going to translate. Uh, and uh, I don't know, let's um, pick something. Um, I heard that there's a famous Senegalese movie. Yeah, Atlantics, yeah. So there's a famous uh, Senegalese movie, and uh, there is no article yet about it in Yoruba. So uh, again, how did I do this? I will show this uh, one more time. New translation, select the language from which I want to translate. So this will be English now. Oh, yeah, English. And now I type the name of the article, click. So now this is selected. Now, before you go on, please check that the, the correct language is selected. So. This button here shows that it's from English to Yoruba. Notice the arrow here, so from English to Yoruba. Uh, and once I see this, I can start the translation. Start the translation. Now, this takes a few seconds. So introduction, what actually do you see here? So this is the translation um, environment. Content translation is an, an environment for you, the human user, the translator, to translate an article conveniently. Now, I intentionally say human because uh, very often a lot of people from all countries uh, confuse translation, which is what humans do, with machine translation, which is what um, a lot of people uh, use online on sites like Google Translate or Bing Translate or Yandex Translate. So we are not talking about machine translation here. It is your responsibility as a human editor, as a, as a writer of an article, that the article is written well. In some languages, we have machine translation to help you. It is integrated into this tool. I will show you in a few seconds how is it integrated. But um, you are supposed to fix all the mistakes that machine translation makes. M machine translation very often makes mistakes, and you have to fix them. Because you know, if machine translation was perfect, it, it will never be perfect. But if machine translation was perfect, then, then we wouldn't need uh, human translators. We wouldn't need human editors to, to translate from one article to another. But we do need human editors. We do need you, people who know these languages. So you need to read the source article and you need to carefully write the translation and make sure that the translation is correct before you publish. Uh, next thing. At the top of many articles, not all, but a very large number of articles, there is a thing called the info box. So this is the info box. It is now highlighted in blue. You can usually skip it uh, because for, I, I won't go deeply into that, but for all kinds of technical reasons, it is difficult to use uh, content translation to translate the info box. So 
you should skip it. And um, after you publish the translated article, you can add it uh, already to the published article. So for now, let's skip, the, let's skip this box and scroll down. And here I get to the actual first paragraph of text. So this is in English. So we are translating paragraph after paragraph. And um, uh, we, are, we are not translating the whole article at once. We are translating paragraph after paragraph. You actually don't have to translate all the paragraphs. If you think that there is a paragraph in the source language that is not really necessary, you are translating, you can just skip it. And uh, let's take a look at the first paragraph. So I'm going to click uh, here. So this is the, the, in the middle of the screen, there's this empty space uh, where you will be writing your translation. So this is the English on the left. In the middle, uh, when you put your mouse uh, pointer over here, you see that it says add translation. So I'm clicking add translation. Takes a few seconds to load. Yeah, so what you see now is that this was automatically filled by machine translation. You can see here on the sidebar, on the right-hand side, that it says initial translation at the top, and then it says use Google Translate. So if you think that this Google Translate automatic machine translation, uh, if, you, if you think that this is useful for you, if you think that this helps you and makes you translate faster, very good, use it. Nevertheless, you have to check every word. So I, unfortunately, I don't know Yoruba, so I can't say which mistakes uh, are here, but I'm certain that there are some mistakes here in this, um, um, in this uh, paragraph because machine translation always makes mistakes. So how do you fix these mistakes? Again, I'm just going to type something random because unfortunately I don't know Yoruba, but you just click here and let's say that, I don't know, this word is incorrect. It's unnecessary here. So I'm just going to delete it. And I don't know, this word, I, I'm going to add something. Um, uh, just, uh, you have to check every word and you have to fix this. Now, let's take a look at some more details. If you like Google Translate, good, it will help you. In some languages, we just don't have Google Translate. It's just not available for that language. So uh, Google Translate, if I remember correctly, uh, for the languages of Africa, it is available for uh, Hausa, Yoruba, Igbo, uh, Zulu, Kosa, um, and I think Nyanja, and maybe Siswati. And uh, I think that this is it. And uh, unfortunately, no other languages of Africa are supported by Google Translate. So Chui, for example, which is spoken by a lot of people, unfortunately is not supported at all by Google Translate. So if you are translating into Chui, what you will have to do is to just uh, delete everything and just type by yourself. Uh, some people say, um, some people misunderstand this and say, uh, machine translation doesn't work when I translate into Chui. No, it works. It's just that you have to type everything by yourself. It's actually not such a big difference because if you do use machine translation, you have to check every word in any case. So typing from scratch and checking every word that machine translation does is actually not that different. You do have to check every word. Um, now, let's take a, a look here. Uh, I will go to the next paragraph. Let's imagine that I already did this paragraph. So I'm going to uh, click on the next paragraph. Let's take a look uh, that we see. Okay, so this is a very good example. So you see, this is the text. Let me uh, disable. Um, let me disable uh, spell checking, and um, the you can see here that most of the text is in black letters. So black letters is just usual text. The blue text here is a link. So this link was automatically adapted from the source article. So you can see here that in the English it says the Atlantic Ocean. So there is an article about the Atlantic Ocean in the Yoruba. Yoruba is the language into which I'm translating. So there is an article about the, uh, Atlant uh, about the Atlantic Ocean and the content translation system automatically found how to, uh, uh, how to link to the article about the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I'm actually not sure that this is spelled correctly. Like the link is correct, by, but, but maybe the, uh, maybe the, uh, spelling here is incorrect. For example, I can see uh, on the sidebar. So this is how the article is actually called in Yoruba. So there are 
here the tone marks, the uh, high tone, the low tone, the uh, mi and the do. Uh, so you can uh, you can add them. Let's see. Uh, I have to I have to fix it. So I think it will be something like this. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and like this, and I guess like this. Yeah. No. Uh, well, I'm not sure how to type this. Anyway, so uh, so. I have to I have to fix this even though even though the link is adapted, uh, you have to check that it is written correctly. Now there will also be some gray text. The gray text means that it is an it is uh, a link in English, but there is no such um, article in the Yoruba Wikipedia in the in the language into which you are translating. So in this case, you have two choices. You can just ignore this and not do anything. Uh, and if you just don't do anything, that it, then it will be when you publish the article, it will be just published as usual text. And when you uh, you can mark it as a missing article, uh, or as we call it um, in our Wikipedia jargon, a red link, because a link to an article that, that doesn't exist yet is called a red link. It appears usually in the red color. So if I, for example, th this uh, this uh, Yoruba word, if there's anybody here listening. Um, and who knows Yoruba, then this says uh, Ojo. Uh, I guess this means employment. Uh, I just guess by what it says in the English text. So if I click now, mark is missing, it will appear in red. So there will be this link. It doesn't mean that like the article Ojo, it will not write itself. You will have to write it later, but it will be a red link. So you can do this. Um, uh, if there are, so there are no images here, and uh, I'm uh, getting to the end of my time soon. Uh, maybe if I have time later, I will show you images, but just very briefly, if there are any images, photographs in the source article, you can just copy them to the target article by just one click. Uh, just, like you, just like you click on paragraphs to add translation, you can click, on, um, you can click uh, on the empty space for the image and the image will just appear there and that's it. That's all you have to do. However, some images have a caption underneath them and you have translate the caption. You have to click on the caption text under, under the image and you have to translate the caption, but, but that's it. That's all you need to do to translate uh, the image. You also have to check the title of the article at the top. So here it just copied the title from the, from the English uh, Wikipedia title, uh, Atlantics, it just uh, made Atlantics uh, the same. I don't know if this is the correct title in Yoruba, maybe you should change it to something else. If this is good, the same as in English, then, then it's fine, just leave it. But um, maybe you have to change this. So you can see that uh, there's a blinking cursor here and you can change the title. Um, one last thing about the translation. You can see that there are a lot of footnotes, um, also known as citations or references in the English article. So if you look on the English side on the left, you can see like these little numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So th these are notes or references. They are not always automatically copied. Uh, article, uh, unfortunately. They, uh, this happens especially frequently uh, in languages of Africa because very, very unfortunately, the technical infrastructure for supporting these uh, footnotes is less developed in languages of Africa. This is not great. Um, there, there are all kinds of reasons for this. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to speak about this in detail here. Um, so if, if such a reference could not be copied automatically, you will see this number in gray. So you see this number here in gray color. Uh, this will not be published. Uh, when, you, when you publish the article, so there's this publish button at the top uh, in blue. When you publish the article, uh, this will just not be published. Uh, if you do want to add these uh, references, these footnotes to the article, you will have to add them later uh, after the article is already published. Uh, once the article is already published, you can simply edit it as, as any article and it will just uh, work as in any other article. Uh, there is an insert reference uh, button uh, in the uh, toolbar when you are editing. So these are the basics of the um, and once you're done, uh, just publish. Uh, when you are, uh, if, if you, my time is up. Uh, so one, one really last comment. Uh, once you are, um, 
uh, once you publish, it will be published with this title. So um, you can publish directly to what we call the article space. That's the uh, space where the actual Wikipedia articles appear. You can also publish to your user space, which will be like a draft. So it will be already published as a page, but not yet in the main uh, article space uh, like other articles. So you will sometimes want to do this if you think that the article is mostly ready, but you want to fix a few more things before you actually move this to the, to the main space. So to do this, to publish this to the user space, click, click this gear button uh, near publish, and then you can click personal draft, and then you will see that it will publish to your user space. So this is my username slash and the name of the article. And that's all I had uh, for the, uh, for the uh, content translation uh, uh, instruction. I'll, ha I'll be happy to uh, get your questions. Uh, let me see if there are any questions right now. Uh, Yes, there are a few questions. Thank you very much. And I must say this is very insightful for all our three presenters. We are grateful. So there are a few questions I'm going to read out for um, Nick and yourself to actually answer for the participants. The first question goes to Nick. The question is, how best can you help a scholar who have published most of their articles in predatory journals in the effort of promoting open access. Yeah, thank you for that. The, the question, it's an, an important one. And I think you know, the, the effort to combat you know, low quality uh, open access journals uh, is a, a particularly important one. Um, you know, and there are a variety of efforts there, like um, Think, Check, Submit, which is one that we've participated in that, you know, provide resources, um, you know, to, to help uh, authors evaluate journals before, before publishing. Um, you know, and an, another sort of aspect to, you know, sort of low quality or predatory journals is that, um, you know, really does seem like so much of the demand um, to publish in them is created by sort of poorly constructed um, incentive schemes uh, around journal-based metrics, um, you know, so where, you know, researchers are evaluated, you know, positively based on publications and, um, you know, high impact factor journals or, you know, even just quote unquote international journals, um, you know, and so we're, you know, trying to um, sort of support the research community in moving away from journal-based metrics altogether, which, um, you know, should help um, reduce those, um, you know, sort of, um, sort of poorly structured incentives uh, to, to, you know, um, uh, you know to, to publish in those, those journals. So that also doesn't, uh, yeah, obviously uh, answer the question of sort of what to do if, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, uh, an article of yours or somebody else's has inadvertently, you know, ended up in a, a journal that you've later um, found out is, uh, is low quality or, or predatory. Um, and, you know, my sort of best guidance at the, the moment would be, uh, you know, perhaps to try to make sure that it's available through an institutional repository or, you know, another source where then you can provide more, more context uh, around the article. Um, there are also a new class of publication called overlay journals, uh, where, you know, if an article is made openly accessible, uh, either in, you know, journal or repository and overlay journal, um, sort of re-aggregates uh, articles and sort of the, a different kind of like collection around a particular theme or topic, um, you know, and those overlay journals actually could be an interesting way to, um, uh, you know, sort of surface uh, content that may have originally appeared in a low quality uh, open access journal sort of by mistake, um, but, you know, could appear, um, you know, in a, a totally different context through an overlay journal. Uh, those are still fairly new, uh, you know, so they're not going to be as many sort of like readily available overlay journals to, uh, you know, to uh, you sort of get work featured in. Um, but I think you're in hope that those overlay journals will become uh, a much larger part of the landscape as we, we shift to, to open access. Um, um, so I'll, I'll stop my answer there, but um, uh, if, if the, the person who asked or anybody else has any follow-up questions, happy to, uh, happy to address those. 
Okay, there's another question. It says that, how can we reduce this bias against Global South articles and authors since it is likely artificial intelligence will even consolidate it? The question, there's another question. How can equitable participation be achieved? Yeah, so in addressing the bias against, you know, authors from, you know, from Africa, from Latin America, from Asia, um, you know, I think, you know, that there's so many different points in which that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, I, I guess would start with representation on editorial boards that sort of set the sort of agenda or the tone for the entire publication um, and how how much work there needs to be do, done um, to, to have more equitable representation on those, getting back to uh, Barbara Rivera Lopez's point from, from my presentation. Um, you know, I think putting pressure on journals to really uh, make those much more inclusive uh, and represent, you know, the global audience, which they, you know, oftentimes say that they serve, but, you know, it's not not present in their editorial boards, um, would go a long way towards uh, towards addressing uh, those concerns. Um, you know, I think more broadly putting pressure on the large research institutions that set the global research agenda um, to be much more intentional about equity. Um, to be more transparent about representation, you know, in, in their funding and what appears in their publications, um, you know, in their worldview um, can help over time to, to address um, that, that bias that, that is very, very real. Um, unfortunately, I think it's, you know, a longer term effort and that's why, you know, each of the themes for Open Access Week these past three years have focused squarely on equity. Um, you know, and we have have more time to go, um, but I think you know this year's theme is really trying to shift the mindset of um, you know folks that have power to make a difference here to 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 stop you know just talking about these issues or good intentions um, and really shift into a mode of action. Um, you know, really taking concrete steps to address um, you know these equity problems. Uh, you know that that we know uh, exists but are just not moving quickly enough. Um, you know, to to change. Okay, thank you. These other questions goes to Amir. The first question is, how can one copy or translate the start box from English to another language? And then another question comes again. So how do you add the language mark? The third question is, for translating or writing in an African language, can librarians translate to any African language? What happens if the language isn't already represented in Wikipedia. For example, the tree language that you cannot find in the in the translation tool. How do we do that? So yeah, these okay. are three questions. Okay. So for the first two questions, to be honest, actually, I'm not sure I understand them. Uh, if you quickly write clarifications in the chat box, then maybe I'll be able to answer. So I'm not sure what do you mean by the stat box, if you mean the info box? I'm sure it's the information box. I'm sure it is the information yeah. box. Yeah. So, so if it's the info box, for all kinds of technical reasons into which I don't have time to uh, go right now, uh, it is complicated to translate uh, the info box using the uh, content translation. That's unfortunate, but that's just how it is at the moment. I hope that in a year or two, it will be easier, but for now it's difficult. Uh, maybe even earlier than a year, but we'll see. Um, so if, if, if the question was about the info box, uh, then it's that. If you want to talk about this to me in more detail, then I wrote my email and other contact details in the chat. Uh, so you can uh, reach out to me and I will give more details. Uh, so that's about the info box. Uh, about the language mark, again, I'm not really sure what is it about, uh, but if, um, if you're talking about typing special characters, like for example, in Yoruba, you have uh, letters with a dot below or with the accent marks, uh, then um, you know, very briefly, I can say that um, there is a, a typing tool for all the languages of Africa uh, built into Wikipedia. So it appears as a small uh, button next to where you're typing. Uh, if, if I have two minutes to uh, share my screen and show how it works, uh, then, then I will show you. If, okay, if that's okay, I I, 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 yeah, if that's okay, yeah. I will show it. Yeah, so give me just, uh, give me just uh, a few seconds. All right, please do that. Yes, so uh, you can see here, so for example, in Yoruba, uh, in Yoruba, so it works a bit differently in every language, but for example, uh, I click here, 
yeah, so you see, there's this, uh, there's this button. You see where I, where I just clicked? Uh, so okay. if, I'm typing, if I'm typing here, it appears, uh, it disappeared because it's, it's very small, so it disappears uh, so as not to, uh, not to interrupt. But it's, it's a small button. You click it, you select the language, so it automatically selects the language in which you are typing already. So it works a bit like, so this part is the same for all the of Africa. We, we need this, this support for all the languages of Africa. And uh, for Yoruba, for example, uh, you type it like this. So um, if you want to type the letter O with dot below, you type tilde and O, and you get the O with a dot below. Uh, the tilde is uh, to the left of number one on the, on most keyboards. So, and uh, you can also, I think you have this letter. Oh, no, not I. Uh, so which letter do you have with dot below? S, yeah. So S with dot below in Yoruba, you do it like this. And you, can, you also have the uh, tone marks. So you do something like this. You type the letter O and then tilde and then the slash. So it's like, like this and, and like this, right? So if I type O, tilde, Slash. So nice. this is an example from Yoruba. Uh, I promise to be very short. So uh, so that this is it. Uh, I'm not going to show this for other languages, but uh, we have something like this for all the languages. So just look for this small uh, uh, button with a keyboard, and uh, you will you will find your language there. If you cannot find it, please reach out to me. Uh, I will make sure that it works. But it's supposed to work for all the languages of Africa. I like I really I, I went over the whole list of all the languages of Africa. I made sure that it's available for all the languages of Africa. Uh, two weeks ago, I made um, a similar um, a similar training for other people from Africa, and uh, the, somebody found one missing character for the Igbo language and uh, I fixed it and uh, now it's not now it's no longer missing so if you find that something is missing for your language please uh, reach out to me and uh, I will fix this so that's right. that's about that's about typing question. and yes. the the third question says that for translating or writing in an African language can yeah. librarians translate to any African language what happens if the language isn't already represented in Wikipedia yeah, so um, there are many languages of Africa in Wikipedia, but there are still many languages of Africa in which there is no Wikipedia yet. Uh, for example, I know that uh, the big language of Mozambique, Makua, there is no Wikipedia in Makua at all, which is very unfortunate, but that's just how it is. Or I think uh, in uh, Ndebele, uh, one of the languages of uh, Zimbabwe in South Africa, there is uh, also, I think there's no uh, Wikipedia in it yet, uh, which is unfortunate, but this doesn't mean that you cannot write. You can create a Wikipedia in a new language. This is called an incubator. We have a site called Wikimedia Incubator. You can go there and you can start writing articles uh, in this language. And uh, there is a language committee which uh, uh, periodically checks articles in the incubator. And um, if you wrote good articles in your language in the incubator, then it will be uh, graduated, promoted to a full-fledged uh, Wikipedia domain. So this is a very brief answer. There's a longer procedure actually, but uh, very briefly, you have a place to write articles, uh, encyclopedic Wikipedia articles in any language. If, mm -hmm. if there's no full domain yet, you can start it in the incubator. All right, thank you. There, there are more questions for you on this because we are going to use it for the week, for the open access week. So people, there are more questions. The question, there's this other one says that, um, since you did not give us the steps on how to use the wiki platforms and the tra translate it into English, does the, uh, does the platform require a particular software to be installed or should one install a particular software before you can do that? No, you don't need to install anything. You just need a, a computer connected to the web and just go into the Wikipedia and log in and that's it. Uh, it's everything is on the website. No need to install anything at all. Uh, it currently works well on desktop and laptop computers. It currently doesn't work very well on mobile phones. We actually work in uh, to make it uh, more like easier to use on mobile phones. Uh, so I do recommend using a desktop or a laptop computer. But that's it. All you need to do is a is a modern web browser and the web connection, and just log into Wikipedia, and you can use it. No need to install anything. All right. So 
I think that is it for all the questions. Thank you so much to all our presenters, to Nick, to Amir, and to Alice, who is with us as the WIR for the program for our Wiki and AFLIA project. Uh, there are a few things, announcements I'd like to make that the presentation will be sent to all participants, and then the recording will also be uploaded onto the AFLIA YouTube channel. So those who wish to actually uh, listen to the presentation again can go and do so. Concerning the contest, that is the Open Access Week contest, uh, translation contest, I want to inform all of us that there will be uh, prizes or awards will be given to participants that they will receive certificates and the top three editors or the top highest editors will also be given AFLIA and Wikipedia branded souvenirs at the 2021 conference. So this is for the top three. They will receive branded uh, souvenirs, but certificates will be awarded to all contestants. Again, if you wish to know anything, you wish to ask for further clarification or anything, you can simply send a message to the WhatsApp number 233-544-252212, or you can send a mail to afliacom at aflia.net. Um, I don't know if Alice or Stanley, you have anything to say. Otherwise, I would like to round up. Dr. Kim, Alice, or Stanley, Michael, or um, the well, members. Well, thank, thank you, Doreen. Uh, I just simply like to encourage African librarians to please, please sign up, contribute, in the event that you feel you're overwhelmed or you don't know where exactly to go to, we are always on standby to help. You can use your champions. You can reach out to us directly. Our contacts are widely available. And uh, thank you very much for attending this and for your time too. Thank you. Okay. I wish to remind all participants who are not yet or whose institutions are not yet members of AFLIA to kindly visit our website www.aflia.net click on membership and then the four our forms are there kindly download fill and send to membership at aflia.net and be part of this great community you know that in africa aflia is the only trusted voice advocating for libraries to be added onto national policies for better services. Thank you very much. God bless all of us. Okay. Thank you. This is where we draw down the curtains for today's um, webinar. Thank you. <laughs>